The community's strategic plan is the community's vision for the Central Coast for the next 10 years. It's called One Central Coast because this is the first plan for the whole of the Central Coast. We are one region, one council and one community. We live in a special place here on the coast, one in which we want all members of our community to feel valued and have access to a range of opportunities to participate in the richness of community life. And every one of us can play a part in bringing this community vision to life. If people feel part of a community in some way, they'll give without even probably even knowing they're doing it. I wanted to restore this building and get it back to what it was. It was the jewel of the crown and I wanted to get it back to that. Making a difference, I guess that's what we're really here for. The smile on the faces when they see these engines and that bus coming around, they just love it. If you're following what makes you happy and excited and interested, then you're definitely going to live a life that you will be thankful to have lived. At the end of the day, we just had a good idea. We needed the support of many people to turn that great idea into a sustainable venture. My name's Tim Silverwood. I grew up on the Central Coast. It wasn't until I got a bit older and started travelling around the world, I realised that what we had was so special because people don't always treat the environment as well as we do here on the Central Coast. Our programs have focused on going into schools and running events in communities. We also have a huge global online audience. One man cannot solve these big global problems. It's going to take a tribe of people coming together to solve them. It's a really amazing and rewarding journey in, in spreading this message around the world. I've always been on the coast and I've loved the coast. About six years ago I bought the Chapman building. I, I got the opportunity, I saw that it was for sale and I stood back on the car park up there and a village central and I looked down and you know I could just feel this was the place to be. I could just see what the town was. There's always these little niches that are, you know, going back and forth and, you know, I guess it's an obsession for all of us because we saw what Wyong was like and it's getting it to a place where, you know, we're proud to say we're from Wyong. Like it's become a real proud place to be. My name's Chris Wallace, myself and my wife uh, we own Community Fire Education and the Fun Engine. We educate the community in a different way. We teach people what to do in case of fire. One of the biggest things is, is our education bus. What we do, we go out to different fates, festivals, wherever we can go. When we do the, the bus sometimes, we get 2,000 through that bus. I just enjoy communicating and getting out there and just educating in a different way. I'm Meredith Gilmore. I've lived on the coast since 2000, originally from Sydney. Chose the coast because it's close to Sydney, but it's it's got that more laid back kind of thing that I like. I've, I like li living in regional areas. I started visual art in my 40s. It's just so different from what I ever thought that I'd ever do. And it, it is what led me into thinking it would be great to, to talk to people in the arts on the radio. So I started doing some shows, particularly a program called Coast Arts, which was a new show and I reached out into the community because I'm an artist as well. And I just felt like there was a lot of scope on the radio to do interviews with artists and poets and writers and that's been going now for over seven years. My name is Shana O'Brien. I am from the central coast of New South Wales on dark and young land and I'm a dancer. As an Indigenous dancer, we're very inspired by the environment and where we come from, all of the trees, the way that they curve around all of the rocks and the sea faces, the beautiful water, the fresh air, and that plays a huge part in the creative process. I was lucky enough to study at NASA Dance College, which was a super incredible experience. And the facilities, the studios are really beautiful, the staff are incredible, and I feel very privileged to have had the opportunity. Through volunteering, I was able to meet a bunch of really great other young people in the community that are really passionate about helping other people, and that's a way of taking something that I'm very passionate about and sharing that with other people. No matter where I go to work or uh, if I have to spend a lot of time in Sydney, I always come back to the Central Coast because it feels like home and it helps rejuvenate me. 
One of the things about the Central Coast I've noticed as well, which is people are so helpful to each other. They collaborate, they are interested in going to each other's exhibitions, not just to see what people are doing, but so that there are people there and you've got to be competitive, but you don't have to always be competitive with each other. If you're in a position to make a difference, I guess you're obliged to make that difference, really. Just happy to, you know, give it all I could and it became, you know, a local icon and a buzzing taste of day.
Good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of this land and pay my respects to the Dakinjung people, elders, past, present, and emerging. Welcome to this extraordinary meeting of the council called to allow me to present two financial reports, but particularly uh, my what has been come to, to be known as the 30-day report. Uh, there's a small number of people who've come along, uh, along with the media. Uh, thank you for attending. Uh, and also I'd like to acknowledge the people uh, who are watching this through the webcast, either live or uh, subsequently. I believe what I'm um, releasing today is very important information for this community in terms of, as I've said, understanding uh, how we've got to where we were from to here. Uh, what I think is appropriate in terms of acknowledging responsibility uh, and charting a way forward. I have nothing to declare, nor does uh, any of the managers present in regard to the content. I'm going to read Hard copies of my report will be available after the meeting for those of you that have turned up. Uh, and uh, if, if people who want a hard copy want to attend account, one of council's offices, they'll be available there. If you're not able to access it on the internet, appreciate some people can't. Um, I'm going to start by, I suppose, acknowledging this is a pretty tough day uh, for the uh, Central Coast community. Um, and it won't get any easier as I work through this, I don't think. This report sets out my preliminary findings and conclusions about how Australia's sixth largest council found itself moving from a $65.4 million surplus at the time of amalgamation in 2016-17 to a substantial final loss in each of the three years since and to a position where it, it indeed needed a state government bailout to pay the staff and creditors. The report attempts to answer some of the questions raised by ratepayers and residents about how this happened, who was responsible. It defines options available to move the Central Coast Council from where we are now to where we need to get to if our unsustainable losses are to be turned around, our debt repaid and services and community projects are once again to be able to, be reason to meet reasonable community expectations. Central Coast residents have been badly let down by their council and widespread anger over the council's performance is totally understandable. I'm now going to read through the dot points of my executive summary and I'll go to the conclusion. There's a body of the report which will be available to people who want to read more detail. The financial crisis confronting this council is very serious. It will take urgent, and I'll stress urgent, and strong action to turn things around. The council's operating loss for the, for the current financial year is forecast to be in the order of $115 million. This follows last year's loss of $89 million. At the end of this financial year, Accumulated losses over the past four years will be over $200 million. Accumulated debt, including funds required to be repaid to our restricted reserves, will be in the order of $565 million. There are no easy measures that would enable the Council to get back into the black and to then achieve the surpluses necessary to allow debt to be repaid, to allow debt to be repaid. This is a story about the failure of a council to understand or practice the basics of sound financial management. The investigation finds no evidence of theft or corruption. The newly amalgamated council clearly did not understand how much money they had at the outset. They set about a program of expanded capital works and expanded services that they could not afford. Apart from the budget mismanagement, Council funded much of this 
new expenditure from restricted reserves which was either unlawful or done without the approval of the elected body. The previous uh, CFO, Mr Craig Norman, and CO, Mr Gary Murphy, were aware of this unlawful use of funds. While the exact time they became aware remains hard to ascertain, emails and notes discovered indicate they continued to spend funds unlawfully after they became aware and before they advised the elected body. Councillors should not be expected to have identified this unlawful and unauthorised use of restricted reserves, particularly given they were not identified in reports to Council by this, the then CFO and CEO. Nor were they identified in the New South Wales Auditor General's audit for the last three financial years. The Council's rapid financial decline is in part due to several matters with only the IT cost issue directly related to the Council's merger. The substantial costs in IT systems and upgrades and infrastructure net of the, the 10 million government grant is $50 million, with 8 million ongoing. The su substantial costs of an industrial dispute for the previous Gosford Council was then adopted, the solution adopted by the Wyong Council for the 38-35 hour week issue and the unified salary scale and other harmonisation costs were 25.3 million with 3 million ongoing. The 39 million loss of revenue from the, compared to the previous year from the 2019 IPART water pricing determination was also a significant item. The increased costs and revenue losses brought about by the bushfires, floods and COVID-19 are estimated at around $10.5 million. This very substantial sum of new costs seems to have been overlooked by the new council as it embarked on major spending programs in both capital works and general operations. In 2019-20, the council embarked upon a $242 million capital works program which is 69 million more than the average capital spend over the previous two financial years. On the incorrect assumption, the capital works program could be paid for from restricted reserves. The council agreed to another $224 million program this current financial year. Mr. Hart, council's acting CEO, will reduce that to 172 million. A number of these projects exceeded their budget for example, the water fund exceeded its capital budget allocation by $12 million. The sewer fund exceeded by 2.6 and the drainage fund by 1.2 million. There is no evidence that either the elected body or senior management gave a priority to achieving savings possible from the merger. To the contrary, council embarked on a number of expansive initiatives, some with highly paid staff that resulted in employee costs significantly outstripping projected revenue growth. There were around 250 more people, full-time equivalents, here now employed than at the time of the amalgamation. Budget financial management is the singular most important task of the council, which of course is made up of both the elected body and the CEO and senior management. While there are several mitigating circumstances outlined above, which may explain how the 2019-2020 budget got away from the Council with an $89 million operational loss, I find there is no reasonable excuse for this current year's budget overrun, which is now forecast to blow out beyond $115 million. If the tough measures outlined later in this report were taken in March, April last financial year, when that year's losses became clear, Council would now be somewhere between 50 and $100 million better off. The CEO is the accountable officer with overall responsibility for financial management. Required performance was not met. The CFO is the responsible accounting officer and likewise, his performance did not meet the required professional standards. Some members of the elected body have claimed they were denied information by council officers. They've said this to me directly and I've heard them in the media. 
The elected body has ample powers to obtain any financial information they want. Whether they did not know this or did not know how to do this is not the point. They also failed to perform one of their most important responsibilities. I will be asking the Minister for Local Government for a further three-month appointment as Interim Administrator to oversee the recruitment of a new CEO, to, de to deliver a balanced budget for 2021, to oversee the introduction of appropriate financial reporting systems and the introduction of contemporary budgeting systems and practices. The new CEO will be mandated to deliver uh, surplus budgets until working capital and reserves are restored to their appropriate balances. There are many council staff working hard to deliver services in their community. And in most cases, they live here. It is, lit it is literally their community. It is important that our residents not take out their frustrations and in some cases anger on these valued public servants. What has occurred is not their fault. I'm going to my conclusion in this report on page nine. <coughs> Excuse me. The current financial position of the Central Coast Council is parlous, with council again approaching serious liquidity problems, as well as another operating loss in the order of $115 million. Total accumulated losses since amalgamation are now over $166 million. That's 223 over the last four years, but there was a $65 million surplus in the first year. At the end of this financial year, total council debt will have increased from $317 million at the time of merger to an estimated $565 million at the end of this financial year. That's inclusive of the two, around 200 million of restricted reserves that will be needed to be repaid. They, in fact, become debt. Staff costs have risen by 43% since the amalgamation, while revenue has risen by only 6%. Staff numbers have risen by 13%, from 1875 at merger to 2117 now, that's full-time equivalents, that's an increase of 242. Acknowledge, acknowledging a range of variables, like the IPART decision, the impact of fires, COVID-19, and increased IT costs, were beyond the Council's control. They were known, and the real failure of both the organisation and the elected body is one of budget financial management. This is particularly the case, in my view, for the current financial year, where all these things were known. Actions are in train to deal with this situation. However, the willingness of lenders to provide necessary further loans, either public or private, is totally dependent upon the council embarking on an urgent turnaround strategy to ensure next year's budget is at least break even. These measures will need to include significant asset sales of at least 40 million over each of the next two years, further borrowings, a substantial rate increase, an increase of, in some council charges, a major reduction in council senior and middle management numbers, and a reduction in general staff numbers to return to the level somewhere similar to that of the time of amalgamation. As I said earlier, I will be seeking a three month extension from the Minister for Local Government to ensure these measures are put in place, along with the recruitment of the new CEO with the necessary ex expertise and experience to lead the organi organisation into what I believe can be a strong and prosperous future. I just want to cover a few points that uh, may be a bit of duplication here, but it's important to emphasise. I make, again make it clear, uh, I think the elected representatives should not have been expected to understand the complexities involved in the restricted reserves issue. They were not aided by the CFO or CEO, nor were they aided by the Auditor General identifying those matters. I think that, that speaks particularly to the complex nature of that situation. The more serious shortcoming, though, occurs with the, the budget management. There were 
there were ample signs some time ago that the budget was in trouble. The IPART decision, for example, the, 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 the March, April reporting of the previous financial year showed that they were in serious trouble. I think at $40 million loss at that point, headed, that headed to be 89. Uh, this year, uh, they set about with a budget of uh, aiming for con considerable savings. Again, nowhere near being met, obvious by the end of the first quarter. So the measures that uh, have an element of shock horror that I'm now introducing uh, should have been done some time ago. Community anger is totally understandable. I've heard people in the media, on social media saying, I mean, one's actually su suggesting a class action against the council. I'm not sure who that person thinks will pay if they succeed in the class action. Uh, as I've said before, this is the People's Council. So there's a bit of woolly thinking out there. Uh, anger is understandable, but a, a strategic approach is now required. And I call on the members of the community to reserve their anger for those that are responsible, but accept that there is no, there are no choices here. We cannot, we do not have the luxury. And just to put it into perspective, the possible 10% rate rise, which I now think is more likely than not, if, if I part agree to it, that generates $17 million extra a year. We've just lost 89 million and we're on track to lose 100 million. It's not actually on its own anywhere like closing the gap. Um, re reducing staff levels is likely to reduce the budget by 30 million a year. Combining all these things together will help. Asset sales, well, we've got debt of over 550, around 550 million. So asset sales of 80 million uh, are significant, but they're only a partial contribution. So not only do we have to get back to a surplus, so we have to, we have to work bloody hard to get back to a break even, then we have to start to work towards a surplus to pay down a fair bit of that debt over time. We don't have to pay the debt down to zero, but we have to pay a fair bit of it down. We certainly have to pay back the 200 million in restricted reserves. So that means if we can get into a situation where their operational surplus is occurring, they're not going to be available for nice to have projects. They will only, we will only be doing necessary projects for some time. People in the community may have a different view about necessary projects uh, and we'll have good discussions and argument about that. That's, there's no problem with that. I'll be very hard in my response to people who come forward now with propositions that don't accept the, the, the reality of our situation. For example, there's no chance to have discussions about the asset sales. I would love to have, I've always been the, the number one consultant that's how I've done my job to the maximum extent possible and I've really meant it and I've really listened and I would normally do that but we do not have that chance. If we do not show our lenders, either whether they be banks or possible government, that we have a serious strategy in hand to deal with our financial crisis, they won't lend more and in fact one private lender may pull back their loan. Uh, so it, it's, it's not a question of uh, this unelected person coming up with ideas that, that uh, you know, don't involve any consultation. We do not have time to do that. And, and I would ask people to respect the combined experience that Mr Hart and I have over t too many years uh, as both chief executives of large government departments and, <coughs> and, and running successfully running councils, uh, all of which have been um, earmarked with, with uh, generous consultation and community input, uh, we would do that if we could. Uh, so I apologise for the fact that this is having to go faster. <coughs> I want to thank uh, uh, Mr Hart for his leadership. Progress is well underway on a number of fronts because of his hard work and determination. The council is lucky to have someone of his experience and capability leading the recovery. And I'm only sorry he'll not be applying for the full-time job when it becomes advertised. But like me, he's somewhat anxious to get back to a well-deserved retired life with grandchildren and recreation. Uh, our new CFO, Natalia Cowley, 
uh, is the best decision that the last council made in, in uh, recent decades. Uh, she's been invaluable in sorting out this mess. She's tough. Uh, and I can tell you, and I can, uh, I can assure the community, they can be confident there will be no repeat of what has happened if she's here, as long as she's here. You'll know about it uh, and it won't happen. Uh, in my office, uh, my executive officer, Cass McNamara, has been wonderful in helping me pull this together. Uh, this, we were still making adjustments to this report an hour ago. Uh, she worked all weekend with uh, myself, Mr Hart and Ms Cowley, uh, and I appreciate the, the support you've given to get us to where we are now. I'm going to conclude this section of the, of the report by genuine, generally saying, on behalf of the Council, uh, I acknowledge the hardship these actions will cause, and I sincerely apologise for the real impact previous financial mismanagement will have on the residents and ratepayers of the Central Coast. I move the motions that the report be adopted and noted and adopt that as a decision of council. We have another item which is to do with a uh, financial report uh, that's a, a couple of days uh, overdue, but it was relevant to this report, so I invite uh, Ms Cowley to speak to that. Through you, Mr Administrator. Um, the quarter one financial report is being presented um, to council. And the Chief Financial Officer's recommendation is that the Council note that it is the opinion of the Responsible Accounting Officer that the quarterly budget review statement for Central Coast Council for the quarter ended 30th of September 2020 indicates that Council's projected financial position at 30th of June 2021 will be unsatisfactory at year end because the forecast year-end consolidated operating result before capital amounts for council is a loss of 115.1 million. The loss of 115.1 million includes 45 million of one-off structural costs. It is my responsibility to, uh, to provide the undertaking of our of council's remedial actions or when I put in an unsat unsatisfactory um, a view of the financial statements and as such the following remedial actions are being noted. Structural reduction in operating expenditure, seeking special rate variation approval from the independent pricing and regulatory tribunal, reducing capital expenditure, seeking bank loans, generating additional income and selling underperforming assets. The details of the movements for the quarter one are noted in, in that report and also detailed by department and unit um, as an attachment. Thank you very much. Um, I'll just point out, draw attention to, in terms of this year's projected loss, you'll see there that uh, the 115 million includes uh, some one-off structural costs. Uh, that will be to fund the redundancy uh, payments that will be involved in reducing staff back to the level of merger. Um, there, are, there have been other actions taken to stop it getting larger, so you can't quite net that out from those figures, but I just wanted to give that by way of explanation. <coughs> I move that, uh, those recommendations and adopt that as a decision of council. I'm going to finish uh, by repeating some of the comments I made uh, during a Scott CEO interview uh, on uh, uh, Monday, anyway, he repeated, replied it today. Tuesday, and he replied it today. Uh, I thought when I did the interview, maybe I'd been a bit emotional. Uh, when I heard it again today, I thought, no, I, I was appropriately angry and frustrated. And one of the things that frustrated because it had been a previous interviewee, uh, which was a politician giving the normal excuses and explanations and blaming other people and whatever. Uh, Mr Hart and I have a huge uh, time of experience in local councils. I'm not critical of merging councils, but I was very critical of having 15 councillors. Uh, it is a stupid idea. It was done for political reasons. Uh, 
to try and give maximum representation and minimise the damage. You cannot seriously expect to have a council act like a governing body with 15 people. It's absurd. And uh, I, don't, I, I don't have any expectation that this will change because of my comments, but I'm just, I suppose, what they're speaking truth to power, uh, that's, that's how I feel. A number of these councils, uh, and a number of smaller councils become divided. But usually they still have the ability to work on shared issues around maybe a ward interest if they've got wards. I, I also don't support wards. I mean, I'd like to think a council, everyone in the council has the whole area and a, and a broader strategic overview at heart, but that's just Don Quixote stuff. <coughs> but this council is like one of many that we've seen who become divided. Uh, in this case, it's politically divided with party affiliations. The division is not helped by uh, state and federal members of the respective parties getting involved and using council issues to further their own point scoring or developing political advantages as they see it. And you only have to look at the, any of the meetings, if you, or some of you have been to every meeting, but, and most of the media have covered it, but it's very clear that that's been what's happening here. What happens when that, when that occurs is the ability to compromise and work together breaks down. Uh, in party politics, hatred is the strongest thing that drives people. Uh, when the Gillard uh, government was hanging on the decision of Windsor and uh, what was the other fellow's name? The member for Port Macquarie? Hanging on their decision of who they were going to support. Rob, Rob uh, Oakshot, thank you very much. Uh, people were wondering, I said to a few people, I said, there's no doubt how they're going to go. Why do you say that? Because, because hatred drives things in politics. And once Mr Oakeshott was shunned by members of the National Party for marrying an Indigenous woman, uh, he, he clearly wasn't going to get over that. And once Mr Windsor's wife was treated rudely in the street by former friends and whatever, because he'd made a decision and had been not going to get over that. And sure enough, that, that's how it came out. Well, hatred is happening here. I've spoken to all of the councillors, other than the two that resigned, and a number of the MPs. And interestingly, a good number of the councils on both sides of this debate have indicated a desire to work differently. Uh, some of them indicated they're not sure whether they'll come back, and you can understand why they may not put their hand up again uh, at the next election. I've encouraged them to do so, and I've pointed out that leadership uh, can come from all sorts of people. It doesn't have to be the most senior or the most powerful. But it's important, in my view, if the council ever is to function properly, that the members on uh, what's now a divided council look for opportunities to work together. And it's important here because there was a time when, they, when the crisis became apparent, they needed to act like a governing body and not a parliament, and they didn't. And so I put it down a lot to that point and I'm encouraging members of the community to think about this, get a debate, a discussion going, and let people know you want it to be different. Otherwise, uh, well, I'll tell you, I won't be back, <laughs> but there will be an administrator back if, if they don't change their habits at some point in time. Uh, and I know uh, people who've got experience, uh, like myself, uh, share the, the same observation. So having said that, um, Sermon from the Mount, I uh, declare the meeting closed and look forward to talking to others and the media uh, shortly. The copies of, of my report are available now at the back, and I'll leave a short break so that the members of the media particularly can have a chance to look at it before they uh, ask me questions. Thank you very much.